Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent again. If you want to use an ESP8266 module to build things for the Internet of Things, you have to give at least the access point information to the ESP module. Usually, your application needs more information like the place you are if you want to create a location-based thing. This can be done by hard coding it into your sketch. But then the thing only works for you. If you want to distribute it or show it to your friends at another place, you have to use a different method. In this video I will show you how to enter information to your ESP module with your smartphone and store it to the EEPROM for future use. To keep the overview, in the first episode I showed how to connect to a web service. Next, I had to program a module which is already built into a thing. Today, I will concentrate on the web interface. To do so, we have to understand how the ESP modules connect to the Internet. Each ESP module can establish its own subnet or it can connect to your access point or both together. For an IoT platform, the ESP has first to create its own subnet because it has no information about the access point to connect. We start this mode with the two commands on the screen. You can omit the password if you wish. I choose the name ESP and no password. You can now connect with your smartphone or laptop to this network and go to your browser. In this mode, the address of the ESP modules is always 192.168 dot four dot one. We want now that the ESP creates some HTML pages for us to enter the needed information. To do this, I found a very useful framework from John Lassen. I post the link in the comments. This framework consists of several parts. Let's go through it one after the other. Firstly, it needs a file for each page our ESP has to display. In my case, I have six pages, one being the overview and five detail pages to enter the different data like access point information or information for my main application. These file names start all with the name page underscore and end with the ending dot h. Here you see the pages in your browser. The first is the root page. On the next page you can enter the network information. And on the next you can enter the information about a time server. This page is only necessary if you need actual time for your application. John fortunately included this service in his sketch and I was more than happy to use it. He even programmed the rules for daylight savings time into the sketch. The last page was added by me. I took one of John's pages and adapted it to my needs. Unfortunately, I have no clue about HTML language. So I had to do it by trial and error. Because we want to create a thing which looks up the next departure of the public transport, I have to enter the name of my home station and the names of the two stations in opposite directions. In my case, I live at the end station of the bus and I have only one direction to go. In addition, I have to input the time it takes me from my home to the bus station and also the minutes the thing should start to announce the arrival of the next bus. Of course, you can create your own page with your own variables and names. Let's look into the newly created file pageapplicationsettings.h. In the red block, you can define the text 
which appears on the screen. I set the IDs and the value fields accordingly. In the green block, you can choose the file name, which is called if you push the back button on the top left of the screen. Here it is root. In the next block, you have to map the fields to the variables in your application. The values are stored in a structure called config. You see this structure for comparison on the right side of the slide. If we look at the screens, we see that each page is built in two parts. First, the frame with the text is drawn and later on, the fields are filled with content. John does this to gain speed and to get around some restrictions of small devices. If you are interested about that, you find more information on his homepage. In the coding, we find the filling code at the bottom. Here again, you have to enter each field name in the right sequence. Now we created the content for the page. As a next step, we have to announce it to the framework. First, we have to make sure it is displayed as a selection point in the pageadmin.h file. We just enter one line and give the page a name. Here, the name is apple.html. In the next step, we have to make sure that the sketch knows about this new page. This is done in the setup of the sketch. We need two lines of code for each page. One to display the frame of the page and the next to display the values. And of course, we have to include the file that the IDE loads it during startup. If we now call the command server.handleClient in our loop section, the whole magic happens. So far, I showed you the human interface to enter application values and store it in a structure. If you switch off your ESP, it will lose this information because it's only stored in memory. This is not good and therefore we have to go on to the next step. Store it in the EEPROM. EEPROM is the part of the ESP where permanent data can be stored. It has a size of 4096 bytes and can only be written a few thousand times. Fortunately, a library exists with a few commands. We always have to start with the EEPROM begin and the size we want to use, similar to the serial begin command. Then we can EEPROM.read or EEPROM.write. At the end of a write session, we have to issue an EEPROM.commit to transfer the data into the EEPROM. You see here that every byte has to be written one after the other. This is not very comfortable and other commands exist. EEPROM.put and EEPROM.get. I nearly lost a day with experimenting with them and was not able to use them without crashing the ESP. Maybe they get more stable in a later release. If your sketch starts, it has to find out whether already a valid configuration is stored in the EEPROM. If you start with a virgin ESP, the EEPROM of course is empty. This is why John writes letters CFG into the first three bytes of the EEPROM. If the sketch wants to read, it just checks if these three letters are present. Nice trick. This is all for this episode. I showed you how to interface your ESP to your smartphone and enter initial values for variables like access point credentials. And I showed how you can store them permanently and retrieve them at startup. In the next episode, I will concentrate on the application itself. Programming things with the ESP8266 needs some special considerations. For example, we do not want to block the system from the interactions 
and make sure it reacts to human input as fast as possible. We have also to take into consideration some aspect of the ESP architecture and we have to make sure that the device can recover from an unintended crash without human interaction. Just subscribe the channel if you do not want to miss it. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye!